It does rain, although not so often around, around here. So what causes the rain? Um, well, if, if you listen to the weather people, they'll talk about pressure and they'll talk about temperature. And I don't know about you, but I've never been able to understand how this combination of temperature and pressure could yield rain. Um, so, of course, another question that people here are likely to, uh, to raise is what about, what about charge? Is somehow charge involved in, in weather and in bringing, in bringing rain? We know that there's charge there. And I'd like to bring up the principle of induction. This is Faraday induction, which I think is known to many of you. So if you have a positive charge sitting up here, if it's really far away, it doesn't do a whole lot. But if it's closer, it will begin to induce opposite charge down here. And the closer it is, the larger the opposite charge that's generated. It doesn't matter whether this charge is positive or negative. Uh, basically, the same thing occurs. And this force is always attractive. That is, if you have the negative here, you'll always have positive here. And they attract one another. And I think. This principle, this simple principle that we all know about is really critical. Uh, an example of it is here. You take a balloon and you rub it on your shirt. And notice, same shirt as in the movie. It's the only shirt I own. <laughs> uh, embarrassing moments. Um, and you put it next to the faucet. And the faucet bends quite appreciably. It's, it's fun, a fun thing to demonstrate for kids. Um, and what's going on? Well, the balloon is charged by the triboelectric effect rubbing on your shirt or your hair, induces opposite charge, and the two are attracted. And so the, the stream bends this way. So we, we have the same, the same uh, principle going. We go back to the cloud, and the cloud, we have the negatively charged vesicles containing the water, and we have positive charges. They come together to form a negatively charged cloud. And um, w when, when positive charge, more positive charge lowers the cloud, right? It comes closer to here. There's an inductive force, uh, positive here, negative here. And, and this pulls the water from the cloud. It's a simple pulling force that can do that. So I think a possibility is that precipitation occurs inductively. I'll go back to that in a moment. Now, what about wind? So we know the wind occurs, and we, we sometimes think that <coughs> it's the fire of the dragon that, that creates the wind. But, but what, what creates the wind? <laughs> um, we, you know, we don't know. Is it pressure gradients, which I think is what you will read in, in the textbook? Um, but it's kind of difficult to understand how you get a wind gust. Gust is pretty local. And of course, the gust can be powerful, as you, as you see here. And I think it's possible that charge gradients are responsible for wind. And why do I think so? So here's a diagram that you, you've seen. Here's the Earth, and here's the positive charge in the atmosphere. And it's known from measurements that protons diminish with increasing altitude. So here you have the highest electric field, and it diminishes with increasing altitude. At night, it's very small, possibly because there's not much evaporation and the positive charges don't get into the atmosphere. During the daytime, it gets much higher. And this is well known. This is not a conjecture. So here is low electric field, and here's high electric field. Now, this is taken from, from a published paper. And what we're seeing here is the electric field up high in different places on the Earth. So forget this one for the moment. That's integrated over all of them. Let's look at Africa and Europe. And this is GMT. So we see that the peak electric field in Africa and Europe occurs at 1,400, roughly, GMT. So this is in Africa and Europe, roughly early afternoon. It's when the sun is the brightest. The sun is really shining. And you see it's much bigger than than in, in the evening, look at the Americas. The peak occurs at about 2100. It occurs later than here. Again, it corresponds to when the sun is really up high in the sky. And the difference between 
Nighttime and daytime is huge. It's a factor of 10. There's a big difference between the two. So think about it. Um, the electric field is high here and it's low here. So that means you've got a gradient, high electric field, low electric field. So in, in this case, you've got a lot of positive charges here and very few positive charges. The positive charges repel each other. They want to escape. Where are they going to go? Well, they're going to go this way. And that gives you wind. And um, I think with, with this, I don't have time. I think this can explain both the trade winds that blow from east to west and, and the um, uh, prevailing westerlies or jet stream that flows from west to east. They occur, originate at the two different light-dark boundaries that gives you wind. So what about a gust of wind? Well, I think a gust of wind could occur with a local charge gradient, depending on the plants and the structures that e exist uh, there. So I think they, it's possible that the origin of wind comes from atmospheric charge gradients. Now, what about exotic weather? Seattle is not like Phoenix. <laughs> uh, this is what it looks like in the typical uh, winter time. And we get a fair amount of rain. And people get caught downtown, you know, without their umbrellas, and, uh, and they rush to their cars. So what's going on? Why, the question is, why in Seattle do we get a lot of rain in the winter, whereas the summertime, it's a bit like Phoenix, although a little bit, a little bit cooler. Um, and remember, this is the mechanism that we've deduced for, uh, for clouds. You need the humidity with negative charge, and you need positive charge to bring these together. And of course, you need enough positive charge to bring it together, because if you have a trivial amount, it won't, it won't happen. So think about the winter in Seattle. Okay, now, when it's winter in Seattle, in the summer, the Earth is tilted in such a way that in the southern hemisphere, you've got a lot of sunshine occurring, right? And this lot of sunshine builds positive charge way up into the atmosphere. We don't get it here, but we get it here. Now, where does this charge want to go? Well, the charge wants to escape from here, the high atmospheric charge, so it goes this way. Meanwhile, you have the prevailing westerlies going this way, and the two are combined to bring moisture uh, into Seattle in the winter time. And so you're getting a lot of charge uh, coming in, and the situation is like this. You have a cloud, charge comes, right? And the addition of more positive charge reduces the negativity, so the cloud gets lower. And of course, ah, sorry a lot of these vesicles begin to be attracted to these positive charges. So the cloud begins to, um, the cloud, because of the positive charge, begins to lower. And because of additional positive charges, these clouds can actually merge with one another. So not only do they get lower, but they get larger. And this keeps happening, gets lower, um, and it reaches a point where you have an inductive force, the negative charge induces positive charge, and that brings the rain. Um, if it's low enough and it induces enough positive charge, the positive pulls the negatively charged vesicles and we get rain. The rain is actually pulled toward the earth. So rain or no rain, it's, I think the cloud must lower sufficiently past the critical point of inductive inevitability, then it rains. It's sort of like an orgasm. You know, you're almost there and then you're there, <laughs> if you will. Interesting scientific fact. Some guys, not, not this one, <laughs> this one. <laughs> some, some guys used high-speed video to record rainfall. And we all know, if you have a droplet that's falling based on its size, and physical properties, you can compute the velocity. Well, they measure the velocity, and they found that it was up to 10 times higher than you could, you could imagine due to, uh, to, to the fall. And so they concluded 
this was published in Nature, they concluded that there is a pulling force that brings it to the earth. I need about three minutes, okay. Now, exotic weather, uh, for the Australians who are here, I think this comes from Australia. Uh, we have these thunderheads, which can yield um, intense rainfalls, and notice the, the uh, curvature around here. Uh, if you think about the Earth that's rotating, you know, if you're standing on the equator, it's rotating really fast. If you're standing up here, the speed is pretty slow. And so there's a gradient along here, which means, because this is always faster than this, clouds will always rotate in the counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere that we see here. So if you think about a hurricane, so um, here's a, a cloud that has negative charge. It's moving in this direction, at least initially, because the trade winds uh, push in, in, in this direction. But think about the atmosphere, the positively charged atmosphere. So this cloud is moving in this direction, compressing all of these positive charges, whereas behind it, it's already passed through. There's not much positivity left. It's left a swath where there shouldn't be positive charge. So this negative charge is attracted to a lot of positive charges. The two will tend to combine. And when they combine, what happens is, remember, you get more positive charge with the negative. This part of the cloud descends. It releases its rain, and it becomes clear. And this will be the eye of, of the hurricane. Meanwhile, the cloud is rotating in this direction for the reason I showed you in the last slide. So you come to here. And again, the same thing happens with, with this region. And, and, and so the eye becomes larger. And it starts curling around until you reach this state where the negative, negative charge right, induces positive charge. And the eye sticks to this. And it keeps going and building like that. And eventually, you get a structure that looks something like this. This is a typical hurricane. And sometimes, you know, you can get one of these uh, typhoons, uh, not typhoons, but uh, um, tornadoes. And think about it. Again, we have the rotation occurring here. And what keeps it all together is, is the first, first point. And most of these particles here are negatively charged. So you've got positive charge that keeps it all together by the like, likes, like mechanism. And by the way, you often see lightning discharges in these. So it's kept together. And because it's kept together, this entire thing is rotating. You get fierce winds out here. And because of the charges, the induction force pulls up refrigerators from here. So we get some idea of what is responsible for the tornado. So I've gone quickly uh, through the in entire cycle evaporation, condensation, precipitation, ice and snow, and so on. And I'm suggesting to you that not only are the mechanisms different from what we've all learned, but that a central feature for all of this is charge, negatively, negative charge and positive charge. So I, I um, would, would leave you with, with um, charge is absolutely critical, and there's not a single weather forecast that I've ever seen that says, hey, the charge in the atmosphere is such and such, and because of the charge, we may expect this kind of weather. So I think one day, if, uh, if the atmospheric people begin to take into account that the universe is really electrical, um, we'll know whether to bring an umbrella to work. And before I end, I, I have to talk one slide about the Institute for Venture Science, because, uh, well, for a number of reasons, including the next speaker is deeply involved in it, and Dave Talbot was also involved in getting this, and Susan, uh, getting, getting this started. And the Institute funds promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking. And we received more than 200 pre-proposals. They've all been reviewed. And out of those 200, we picked a dozen or so that are extremely promising. And the people, those people are now uh, drafting full proposals, which we expect to receive in about, uh, well, two weeks. And um, this is a going concern. Of course, we're looking for donors. And um, 
any anybody who knows uh, people um, of of means who have done well and would like to give back to society. I think this is a a really wonderful way of 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 returning to society in in a way that is is meaningful. So I. I end with the book. The book has become popular, and a lot of the ideas and issues that led to the speculations, which is really what they are, that I presented to you, uh, come from this book, where you'll find the evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.